And then he finally comes back. He's like, I, sorry I took so long touching all your shit. I was giving in to my mommy fetish. <laughs> okay. Greetings, listeners, Domestic International and Nomadic Carnival Folk. I'm Dave Reed. And I'm Kristen Riley. And this is the Rotating Cast Files. Where we watch and discuss... Those TV shows that were canceled too soon. Today we are talking about Carnival, Season 1, Episode 2, After the Ball is Over. It originally aired September 21st, Aught 3. It was written by Daniel Knopf and Ronald D. Moore and directed by Jeremy Potiswa. Potiswa. What a fun name to say. In this episode, a practical joke leads Ben to a piece of the puzzle that is his past. According to my favorite source, IMDb. <laughs> and part of the reason it's my favorite source is because of our guest list. Oh. We have Ralph Waite as Reverend Norman Balthus. You can see his nipples on IMDb. You sure can. Um, he was also in a lot of Christian TV and movies, including Chicken Soup for the Soul, a TV series that had something like 78 episodes. He played Dad. What? <laughs> yep. Sin and Redemption. Ooh. Which could either be really Christian or really sexy. Yeah. But it can't be both. <laughs> <laughs> and the bodyguard. As Herb Farmer. Or an Herb Farmer? One or the other. He might be an Herb Farmer. Named Herb. Well, I think most people would know him as John Walton from the Waltons. M most people? If you're going to know him, that show was on for like nine years and had 17 movies. Yeah, but how old do you have to be to have watched The Waltons when it was on? In your 50s. Only? Are you sure? Did yeah. you calculate that right? 1971. All right. I don't know. I to feel 1982. Like more, I feel like more people would know him from Chicken Soup for the Soul because that had 78 episodes in the 2000s. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think it was the late 90s. That's when those books were so everywhere. Do you remember? Yes. Chicken Soup for the... Bowler's soul? Yes, I was going to say the dog owner's soul, but yes, <laughs> both of those are probably correct. My brain went to bowling for soup. I love bowling for soup. <laughs> I know. Every time that I hear a song from them, I'm like, I don't listen to enough bowling for soup. <laughs> They're your full beat? <laughs> yes. A whole different vibe than every time you say that about a bowl beat. <laughs> Previously on Carnival, don't touch me. Son, where's your ma? We can't just leave him. He's still sporting ankle iron. My words, they wash over you like water over a stone. Coin vomit. He was expected. Ben, what are you hiding? Tell me. He's dangerous. I don't appreciate getting shanghaied. Raining blood. Healed. <laughs> oh my god, that was a lot. It was all previously on. That was a lot. That was basically like the um the montage, the nightmare montage that the first episode opened on well the thing about having a previously on when you only have one previous episode you're basically recapping the whole thing it's true okay let's get into it love me or leave me plays on the sound system in the diner i don't know what a sound system is called in the 1920s the lyrics are disagreeable from start to finish and absolutely distract me from what's happening oh. which actually is justin walks into a diner and sits at the stool on the counter it took me a while to come back to what was happening because I kept listening to the lyrics. Ben walks in and sits next to Justin. The two men don't acknowledge each other's presence, which I love. I know that they're both men, but it's so discordant in my head because Ben Hawkins feels like an 18-year-old child and Justin feels like a substantial human man. And, <laughs> yeah. and they just sit next to each other. It's like two men sitting at a counter. It's like, I mean, technically. <laughs> 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 so they don't acknowledge each other, which is interesting. Um, after a few minutes, Scudder, dressed in a black tuxedo and top hat, walks in and sits at a booth behind Ben and Justin. Ben and Justin watch him intently in the mirror above the counter. Intently and obviously. This is very specific motions and everybody is... No one's being coy about anything. Eventually, Belyakov, previously seen in both Ben and Justin's dreams, chasing Scudder during the World War I scenes, enters the diner and sits across from Scudder at the booth. So now we have Ben and Justin at the counter facing... 
toward the kitchens, like you do at a diner at a counter, but there's a mirror that they're looking at and they are looking behind them at the booth where Scudder and Belyakov are sitting. Um, one is in his top hat and tails and the other is in his military uniform. The guys at the counter are drinking coffee and the guys at the table are drinking red wine. I don't know if that's symbolic of something, but I feel like it probably is. If it is, they did not mention it in the commentary track. Okay. What they do mention in the commentary track is how great this scene is because the show in itself is not a very dialogue heavy show. It's true. I think the only things that has anything been said at this point, I don't think anything's been said. And not until the waitress says something. Right. So nobody's talking. The waitress moves over to Belyakov and Scudder and comments ominously, every prophet in his house. A phrase that Daniel Knopf said in the commentary track, I still don't know what that means. <laughs> Great. Okay. <laughs> Good, because I'm like, it is ominous, but what does it mean? He didn't say it uh, explicitly, but I think he just thought it sounded cool. You know what? Ominous sayings can just be ominous sayings. After listening to these two commentary tracks, I like Daniel Knopf quite a bit because he just comes off as a guy who's like, I had this story, <laughs> so I wrote it. It's got some stuff in it that sounds cool. I don't really know what it is. <laughs> some of it's deep. Some of it isn't. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't come across as a person who takes himself too seriously. I appreciate that. So I didn't listen to the second commentary track. I do appreciate that because I... I recently read an article about male authors, which is not exactly one-to-one -one here, obviously. But one of the male authors that was quoted was like, when I write for men, my characters are complex and deep and complicated. And when I write for women, you know, they have emotions and it's, you know, less difficult. And I'm like, have do you know what emotions are, sir? Also, you suck, and I will never read anything by you. Emotions. Famously uncomplicated. <laughs> yes! <laughs> emotions. What are they again? Not deep. <laughs> That's for sure. I was like, based on how the rest of that article was written, I think the author was like, you fucking said that? I'm putting it in here. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, idiot. <laughs> it was great. And also annoying but i appreciate that he's like look some of this stuff because this is a complex story yeah it's an ab there's so much happening but i can appreciate that sometimes i just it, it just is cool sounded cool <laughs> which is <laughs> phenomenal scudder and balyakov raise their wine glasses in a toast as the glasses clink the large window that scudder and the soldier are seated next to explodes inwards showering the four men in shards of glass we see the two men in the booth, they don't react a lot. No. But the two men at the diner counter do. They get blown forward. It's a scenario where if this was shot today, it would all be digital. Yeah. So probably Scudder and Belikov would not move at all. But the fact that these guys have glass exploding into their face, <laughs> right, yeah. you can't help but react a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's very good. And the waitress is nowhere to be seen at this point. And this is where, surprise, the dream ends. It was a dream the whole time. <laughs> yes. I'm sure everybody was surprised. <laughs> but here's the other surprise. Ben and Justin awake suddenly from the shared dream. Yes. I can't remember. Last episode, did we... No, we didn't see that they had a shared dream. We saw that they were having the same dreams. Right. This is the first instance where we see that they are sharing a dream. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Ben goes outside or goes to wash himself at the pump and he's getting harassed in the funniest way. Okay. So the Dreyfus ladies from the Cooch show, if you will remember. Libby and Rita Sue. Yes. Are nearby. They're kind of like lounging near the pump. Making eyes at each other. Yes. Talking in code with their brains. <laughs> yes, as ladies do. Rita Sue is, what is she doing? She's... She's like beckoning Libby to keep going. Yes. Keep, keep talking to him. Keep messing with him. And Libby is basically just making Ben uncomfortable. And it's this part in the commentary where they talk about how they are so happy that they put the Dreyfus family in late, yeah. late in the process. And they are most of the lightheartedness of this show right now. Yes. I want to explain why this 
They're obviously harassing him. They're teasing him. They're making uh-huh. him uncomfortable. But the reason that it's fun and lighthearted is because it's not dangerous at any point. When he really says, all right, cut it out, and he walks away, it's not like they follow him. They're not taunting him. They're not following him. They're basically hazing him and welcoming welcoming him into the carnival. <laughs> <laughs> and also the impetus for the teasing is his poor view of the world. Yes, And him thinking that he's better than them. Yes, and they're very much pointing out that he is not. not. But not in a mean way, either. It's definitely teasing, and there's a bit of a bite to it. But it's one of those things where you're like, he's going to think about this, and rather than being pissed off that he was being harassed, he's going to think about it, and he might actually learn a little bit. Yeah. Rita Sue didn't do anything to that job. The Merchant's Trust didn't do to you. That's right. (laughs) Next, we cut to Sophie and Apollonia. They're arguing. Apollonia wants Sophie to bring Ben to her, right? Back to Rita, Rita's cards again. Okay. And Sophie is saying he doesn't want to, so they're arguing about it. Because after the last time, Ben, what are you hiding? Tell me! Yes, yes. We cut to Jonesy assigning men work for the morning, and Ben's walking by, Jonesy sends Ben to clean out the baggage trailer. Oh, Ben is watching Ruthie shower. Oh, yeah. And Jonesy clocks it. And that's why he gets sent on the wild goose chase, because he was being inappropriate. Amazing. Yeah. Okay, I skipped over that, because everything's happening so fast. I'm... There's a lot going on. I'm rushing to... It's so well done. It is. It is. The scenes are flawless. But yes, good. You know what? He deserves it, except then he does find the baggage trailer because the whole thing is a carnival joke where you (laughs) send off someone who's being inappropriate on basically a wild goose chase or a snipe hunt to the baggage trailer to clean it out. It's not supposed to exist, but then it does. Ben finds a rundown trailer filled with baggage, which he proceeds to dig through on the pretense of cleaning it, just like I would. Yeah. Um, I do love those old suitcases with all of the stickers on them from the places that the luggage has been. The real ones, not the home goods versions. <laughs> I would totally go through all of that too. You know, for organizing reasons. Well, you have to go through to know what's <laughs> worth saving or selling. That's true. I don't know how I would know. I'd be like, these old pictures seem like I should keep them, but I also don't know who they originally belonged to. <laughs> Does anyone care? Why are they here? These pictures must be from the 30s. (laughs) Somebody will be interested in them. He finds a suitcase, and when he's going through it, it contains not only Scudder's top hat, which Ben pops, but also Scudder's trademark black tuxedo, which we've seen in his nightmares, so that's why he's he's curious about it. Also, I would be curious. And it's splattered with blood. Now, do you think he was mystically drawn to the suitcase? Because it's the first thing he grabs. It is. Or is it a wild coincidence? Or, since the whole thing is a setup, is whatever suitcase he was going to grab going to have the stuff in it? Ooh. The first and the last combined. Okay. I think it's a... I think he needed to find it quickly for pacing. (laughs) But also, we're about to find out That it's all a setup, more so than what we originally thought, because when Jonesy sends him off, all of the guys giggle. Yeah. And so we know that it's something, but him finding this first thing is more than just a coincidence. In an old cigar box, he finds an old photo of his mom standing in front of a truck with the label Big Sky Farms. He exclaims, he basically is like, what? (laughs) (laughs) Mummy. (laughs) you know whatever version of that they said in the 1930s and the the wind closes the door to the trailer so he pulls out a zippo which is a definite fire hazard everything in there so dry (laughs) it's so dry and dusty oh you're in danger (laughs) he takes the picture with him and he leaves the um trailer as he's leaving we watch him with the camera the camera pans out and watches him or pans over and watches him leave and we see a fetus in a jar Uh uh-huh and then the fetus looks at us it opens its eyes first so creepy and then opens then looks at us uh daniel noff made sure to say the management is not the fetus by the way oh because this i remembered after hearing him say that this was a controversy at the time was it yes i remember the early internet shit 
Uh, ain't it cool news? Probably because that's where I was living. The, the forearm, the forums that I was going through. That's where you virtually lived. Yeah, there was debate on whether or not the fetus was management. I'm so glad that's not the case. That would be so stupid. <laughs> Come on. Come on, teens on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish. I was like 25. Come on. Oh, no, I was 26. Oh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. I didn't have time to be on the internet when I was 26. Not even once. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's crazy. <laughs> Ben heads back through the carnival and Samson sees him walking by and he says, hey, Ben, hey, I think he says, hey, boy, where you where were you hiding? And Ben tells him that he was cleaning out the trailer. Samson's like, that doesn't exist. So I don't know where you've been for all of this time, but I need you to go stake down the um, they're doing the what ten is it? Ten in one. In case you don't know, circus lingo, uh, the ten in one is the big tent where they have a lot of times they will have. 10 different things happening in one location. Ben's like, but I was actually in the trailer, so. Yeah, this is when Samson explains to him that it's a joke, like hunting for snipe. And in high school, I knew a girl who went hunting for snipe twice. Did she have a picture? I don't think so. How I do think... you go hunting for something you don't know what it is? Well, the thing is you you ditch the person because the hunting for snipe isn't a real thing. Yes. But she went a second time. That is really mean of the people she hangs out with. Also, not very intelligent. Look, I'm not blaming the victim here like you are. Okay. I'm blaming the other folks. It also reminds me of a thing we used to do when I worked at the airport. We would send new people to go look for the keys to the plane. Which I think is pretty funny. <laughs> That's a different thing. Look, if you're going to play jokes on people on the clock so they're getting paid to be joked on. <laughs> okay. I'm okay with it. All right. <laughs> High schoolers are always on the clock. <laughs> ben can't take a joke. No. And no. gets so mad because Samson's like, look, kid, I'm sorry. This was a joke. And Ben's like, it was not a joke. I definitely saw it. And it's like, geez. Ben Hawkins' catchphrase, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so he definitely is arguing with Samson. And Samson is like, dude, what? Fine. Show me. Show me this trailer so <laughs> ben stomps off to go back to the trailer which i understand would be annoying but like chill the fuck out ben <laughs> he's high strung my god <laughs> take a breath <laughs> so they get out to the edge of the carnival that's being set up and there is no trailer surprise it, surprise it was right here god damn it <laughs> <laughs> So then he angrily takes the photo out of his pocket and says, well, look, I got this out of the non-existent trailer. Samson looks at it and he says, does Samson say something? I think Ben asks Samson first, do you know who this is? And Samson's like, no, no idea. I've no never seen this person before in my entire life. Huh? What? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Do, no. you, do you? Do you know who this is? And, and then Hawkins is like, no, 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 no. <laughs> They're both obvious. Who? No. <laughs> They're both obviously lying to each other. So Samson's like, come on, kid, this is not the first time somebody's <laughs> lied to my face. So you don't mind if I keep it then? And Ben snatches it and is like, no, I'm going to keep it. It's mine. <laughs> I found it in the non-existent trailer that totally existed before. He's so high strung. <laughs> <sighs> On the back of the picture, before Ben secrets it away into his pocket again, it says HS and Flo. So they split up. Samson goes to the management trailer and flips through a photo album where he finds the exact same picture. He turns around and looks at a curtain, a closed curtain, and he says, what the hell are you up to? Cut to Justin, who's getting ready for work and makes me realize just how little I understand about men's dress clothing. Why doesn't that second shirt that he has on have a back? And then when he puts on the top shirt, you can't see any of his other shirts. Why is he wearing three <laughs> shirts? But only, why is he wearing two and a half shirts? Well, one of them's a jacket. But it's buttoned all the way up to his neck. It's like a tunic. Yeah, well, yeah. It's like a preacher's jacket coat. That's fine. But then he's got the other black thing underneath it. And then he's got a white shirt underneath that. And then I'm sure he's got an undershirt it's too hot for this many layers, for one. It is. And for two, you can't see any of them. <laughs> no. 
But interesting fact, the prop that he's using is actually a 70-year-old bottle of Vitalis that was never opened until they shot this scene. He's using actual 1930s product in his hair. Oh, okay. I was too busy looking at his clothes and wondering why he's wearing too many layers. Too many layers. It's funny you mentioned that because I'll bring that back around in a bit. Great. Also, staring at your sister's nipples is probably frowned upon in parts of the Bible. Parts of it. Other parts, <laughs> totally for it. Probably pro in other parts. It's very <laughs> hypocritical book. <laughs> at church, we have my favorite singer, yeah. <laughs> Eleanor's son. He is trying. He is saying all of the words, but he is saying them slightly off key and slightly too loud. So you could just pick him out of the whole crowd. And it is my favorite. He's my favorite. It's the favorite of a couple of the children at the church as well. Yes. It's so much fun. Okay, so picture this. You are going to church because you absolutely have to. And if you don't go to church, then everybody in your town is going to know it. And they're going to talk about you for all week. Also, your back. also, you're going to hell. Yes. I mean, also that. But the gossip's really going to be the part that bothers you most for right now. Because you're probably not going to die in the next week. Probably. And... Everybody starts singing in that weird culty way that they always do and everybody's chanting at the same time and it gets real eerie. But then there's this guy and he's really bringing it and he's trying his best. He's there for his mom. His mom wants to go and he's like, mom, all right, I'm going with you. Let's do this. And he is obvious in the whole crowd of everybody being the same. Oh, it's so good. I mean, the rich people don't like it, but I love it. <laughs> As a famously non-rich person. Famously. I'm here for it. Eleanor has been set right. After church, she's talking to the pastor and I, the pastor being Justin, reverend, I don't know. I love when Justin asks Eleanor's son, did you enjoy the service? And he says, parts of it. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite person in this whole season. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. The rich folks, however, are unhappy that the migrants are crowding the church. The church is getting mighty crowded. Yes, splendid, isn't it? I love that. It's got to be exhausting being a reverend, honestly. Yeah. I mean, you're also... Everything else that's going on, it's got to be exhausting. Because you've got these people who believe that it's their church and they own everything else in town, so they should get their way constantly. And just deflecting this would just ugh, be exhausting. Yeah. I mean, it gets better in a minute, but... Also, you're starting to get these weird powers that you don't understand. <sighs> it's like puberty all over again. Oof, puberty in your 40s. <laughs> yes. Glad that's not a thing. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of for women. Oh. In your late 40s, early 50s, menopause is that's basically true. like a whole other... Puberty. Puberty Makes, ball game. Yeah. A puberty ball game. Would it be... Oh, what other sport would it be? As, um... Well, it, puberty in itself. Because it, I don't think it would be a ball game. Well, it does take a long time. Stuff happens and then stuff doesn't happen. And it's like start and stop a lot. Okay. So like baseball. Right. That's what I'm saying. That's okay. why they say ball game. So what other sport would puberty be? I think you got it. I think you nailed it. I can't think of any other <laughs> sport that's... This, this improv game is going nowhere. Golf. <laughs> which is also a ball game. So now we go back to the carnival. It's around lunchtime. We see... <laughs> I wrote the Cooch family. <laughs> D wow. Because <laughs> I, forgot, I forgot their name. Everything's happening so fast. And I'm like, for, put stuff in fast. Okay, the Dreyfus family are sitting around the picnic table. And one of the daughters brings over her plate. And Rita Sue says, girl, that's a lot. Of, that's too much food. If you eat like a lumberjack, you're going to look like a lumberjack. <laughs> and no one wants to see a lumberjack dance the Cooch. Which I said, I do. <laughs> and the Dreyfus girls agree with you. <laughs> yes. And Stumpy seems to find it amusing as well. <laughs> it's pretty good. Now, real quick, I want to mention when they go from the church to the carnival, mm -hmm. they don't do a wipe or a fade or anything. They do kind of a hard cut, mm. which they typically don't do. But just the distinction between the colors at the church and then the lack of color at the carnival is Fantastic. That's a really good point. I'm glad you pointed that out because you're right. Normally it kind of streams into the next thing, but here you're right. It's 
it's kind of a hard cut. Because we're going from this is this group of proper people going to church on Sunday, and here's this other group of working people living, just uh-huh. living life. Oh, it's great. Uh, Babe Ruth has been a running theme, and um, he's in the newspaper. So Samson says something about Babe Ruth, and Jonesy gets so pissed. Well, first, Jonesy's into it. Jonesy brings him up at first. Oh, does he? He asks if Babe Ruth hit number 700 yet, because that's what he's going for. He's going for his 700th career home run. Okay. And him and Samson have a good back and forth, a good friendly conversation, until... Sophie comes in. Jonesy like stands up to like welcome her over here, and then she goes to sit with Ben, and that's when Jonesy freaks out. <laughs> that's what happens. Yes, I thought it was the Babe Ruth thing. Nope, Babe Ruth was just the vehicle, not the impetus. That's amazing. <laughs> Babe Ruth's no good. Hick never done nothing good for anybody but himself. <laughs> Samson's like bite my head off. <laughs> I love Samson. <laughs> and I said. <laughs> Samson, it's time to hire a carnival therapist. (laughs) Yes. Oh, my goodness. So I'm glad that you mentioned Sophie because now we cut over to Ben and Sophie. They're sitting together at lunch and they're chatting. Is this where Sophie asks Ben to come back to come back over to her trailer? Yes. And Ben says one of the wildest sentences of all time. No offense, but your mom gives me the creeping willies. Yeah. Well, how is that no offense? How am I not supposed to take offense to that, Ben? Ben has never communicated with anyone but his mother. It's it's a, such a wild sentence. It is. No offense, but I hate your fucking face. <laughs> so Sophie gets angry, of course, and leaves. Yeah. And then Ben takes the food she left. Oh, this is after he goes harder and says... Your ma's a turnip. Oh, yes. Because Sophie says, come on, she dude. She won't leave me alone. She won't leave me alone. She wants she wants you to come back. And that's when he says, your, your mom's a turnip. turnip. That's when she gets angry enough to leave, which is just like, Ben, go see the carnival therapist. <laughs> it's time. That Samson has just hired four minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> My God. Wow. Listen to yourself. Meanwhile, during their conversation, Lodes and Lila are yes. having a secondary conversation about their conversation. Yes, because Lila says, do you think there's an attraction between them? No, Lodes, Lodes says, says that. that. And Lila says, maybe on her part. And I don't think so after this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Ben pretty much shot that down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a big stupid baby. <laughs> <laughs> Lila starts... Acting a little ribald. Yes. Uh, and Lodes is talking about how, oh, no, that would be dangerous. And at least I'd die with a smile on my face. Oh, I don't think so. Yes. Now, one of the reasons I love Lodes' character so much, do you think he was being actually, you know, like forthright and warning her about something? Or was he just being dramatic again? I can't tell! Yeah. I can't tell ever with him. He just seems so goddamn dramatic. Yes. But his delivery... And he definitely knows shit. Right! And his delivery is so good that it's like, is this... Are you acting? And I gotta I gotta admit something here. This watch when we're watching it, like, critically, is the first time I've noticed that oh, sometimes he's just being a drama queen yes it's so good it's so good for the character but it's also a really nice warning to anybody if you're going to be dramatic about everything no one's going to (laughs) to pay attention to your warnings (laughs) but then if you're right often enough like he probably is then just people don't know what to do with you right and like us and look unless you're a mentalist that's real Which you aren't. Well, loads is, though. Right. Unless you, the listener, are a mentalist. Gotcha. Which isn't real, except for in loads' case. We don't know all of our listeners, personally. That's true. Um, Most likely, you're not more right than wrong (laughs) when you're being this dramatic. (laughs) Very interesting. Next, we cut to the diner from the dreams. So we see... We're in town and we see Justin and Iris walking down the street toward a diner. And Iris is talking about a 
blanket drive that she's trying to get into the newsletter or something, whatever she's talking about. And I'm listening, apparently, as well as Justin is. He For is real. not listening. Even a little bit. Because she's trying to help the migrants and the women's auxiliary is not helping. Yes. Which is not surprising. I don't know any auxiliary women. (laughs) And yes. And she says, what is his middle name? She says his full name. You have not heard a single word I've said. And he stops and he looks at her and he says, is that a new dress? (laughs) She bats him on the arm. and She's like, no, it's not a new dress, you goofball. And they go into the diner. As soon as the door shuts, Justin realizes this is the diner from the dream. And he stands in front of the door. A little weird because this is the town he lives in. I was thinking the same thing. This is not the first time they've ever been inside the one eating establishment (laughs) in this Great Depression town. But whatever. We'll suspend our disbelief for a second. You know what? It probably didn't matter before. It was just the place where you went and got coffee. Yep. And then it all came together when he walked inside and looked up and was like, wait a second. Hey. And then a girl walks in behind him and (laughs) slams the door into his back, which is his fault, by the way. Yes. So they are there to meet with Norman. Norman is a character. You love Norman. You tell him what happens. Well, Norman is also talking about Babe Ruth. Yes. Iris is sick of hearing about Babe Ruth. Yes. And then Norman talks about, he just bought a brand new car. And Iris is like, why are you wasting your money on such frivolous things? And a man of your age should be able to enjoy the fruits of his labors or whatever on the short time he has left. And I'm like, yeah, it makes sense. And she's like, you're going to get in one of those crack ups. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, this is a crazy language. (laughs) (laughs) And then he says, did I mention it's a convertible? Did I mention you're probably taking too much money from your, (laughs) from your, what is it, constituents? I don't know what pastor people. Congregation. Your congregation. um, If you can afford a brand new convertible. 1934 Buick Phaeton. Yeah. I'm just saying. Maybe. Editor's note. In 1934, a Buick Phaeton cost $2,145. Adjusted for inflation, that is about $48,000. That's if you believe this U.S. inflation calculator, which we have our doubts. We're a little skeptical of it. None of it seems quite accurate to us if you look at what things actually cost. But as Kristen is wont to say, we went to public school. So what do we know? A 1934 Buick Phaeton today will run you about $78,000, though. And Buick's most expensive car at the moment is around $61,000. Are they Catholic? I don't think, no, they're not I don't Catholic. think they're Catholic. No. So they're not stealing as much as other <laughs> churches. Other churches are worse. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, it's a fun discussion because Justin is still not paying any attention. He's not here. He's physically here, but he's not mentally here. And when the um, waitress comes over, it's the same waitress from The Dream, which he does not acknowledge. He not- he recognizes the diner. He does not recognize the woman. Until she says. I don't know that he recognized her. He recognized what she said. And she says, every prophet. In- every prophet in his house. In his house. <laughs> it's like every prophet has a house. That's not it. <laughs> every house turns a prophet. <laughs> Every prophet buys a convertible and then gets into a crack up. With Babe Ruth. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And he's like, what? Is this a riddle? (laughs) (laughs) But what she actually said is... Coming right up. Coming right up. Because he ordered tea. Because he didn't want coffee because coffee is what he had in the dream. Yes. Yes. Pretty great. But then Norman goes off on a tangent about Babe Ruth and how... In these trying times, people notice mighty endeavors and stuff like that. And he has this real, probably good speech. But Justin is hearing the wrong lesson. Yes. Babe Ruth is not the hero of this speech. No. Justin is the hero of the speech. Yes. And then when Norman finishes the speech slash prayer, he says, Amen. And Eris (laughs) goes, Amen. (laughs) And Justin's like, I have a whole destiny now. (laughs) This proves it. Yes. Oh, man. So, back at the carnival, Apollonia won't read the cards for Sophie. So, it's actually carnival time now. 
Before we get there, though, we have another speech by Stumpy talking about his daughter is going to strip. <laughs> yes, okay. I'm probably going to mention everything Stumpy says when he's doing the carnival barking. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Uh, when he's doing his barking, I'm probably going to mention every time. Okay. He's talking about this beauty from North Italy. And <laughs> what he claims about her, not European muscle dancing like his other daughter. This one says, she's the woman that all the men in town been talking about. <laughs> and men are dumb. Men are going to be like, I have heard about her. Everybody. Uh -huh. it, that's all it takes. It's so smart. It is. Stumpy is such a great character. I think that's his only line. In this right. episode. Because when we saw him before at the He was just reading the, the paper. At the lunch table, he, he didn't chuckled. say a thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he does say, uh yeah, come on, Rita, let her eat. That's Something right. Like that. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So he has two lines. Yes. And his character says a ton. Yes. Also, his daughter's up there in her skimpy or her not skimpy, it's it's actually covering quite a bit. This one's Libby. This is Libby, and it's a it is slinky. It's like body hugging material and she's just chewing gum and she's hitting all the marks but she is so bored ev between every mark and annoyed because it's so windy yes because the wind keeps kicking up her skirt which is the show <laughs> <laughs> it's great she's just chewing gum annoyed and he's barking and so we've got a whole crowd of men gawking at her which isn't the problem the problem is like she just wants to get out of the wind and be able <laughs> to actually perform <laughs> it's phenomenal at the tarot reading tent or not tent trailer sophie is having trouble reading this woman's cards because apollonia won't tell her what they say and instead of just making something up which I feel like since she's probably been doing this for a long time, she probably could have. She could reach into her memories and think of something. Just tell the lady something. She doesn't want to do that. I know. She wants to give them their actual fortunes. I know. Which is easier to say because I know that I could just make something up and just be like, well, this is no different than what I would normally be doing. As opposed to if I had the ability to give real fortunes, I probably wouldn't want to give fake fortunes. Yeah. Now, do you think Apollonia was not telling her anything? Or do you think Apollonia was just telling her bad things that I'm were going to happen to her? I'm not sure. Because the look on her face... I always read it as Apollonia was telling Sophie the bad things that were going to happen to this lady. I think that might be the case. And she's like, you have to give me something else. Yeah, I'm not going to say that. No, not doing that. So she folds the cards, gives the, the woman her money back and says, I'm sorry, the cards are unclear. <laughs> the woman goes, is that bad? <laughs> <laughs> And we're all like, it probably is bad. You don't know how bad, but it's probably bad. <laughs> yeah. So the lady leaves with her money and Sophie says, well, we got to eat. And then she leaves and closes down. There's a little bit more to that conversation. And the only reason I bring that up is because Apollonia's dialogue is in the shooting script. They mm. actually put her dialogue in the script. Interesting. So Cleo Duvall knows what she's reacting to. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, it's real good. That's amazing. Clea's so good. Yeah. <laughs> she was just... <laughs> just amazing in the one episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, in <laughs> season one, where she turns invisible. And also, but I'm a cheerleader. Great yeah, throughout the whole movie. Sure, that too. The whole 70 minute movie. Watch it. It's only like 70 minutes and it's <laughs> great. You're going to have a fun time. It has a John Waters feel to it, even though it's not John Waters. Yes, it's not as gross. That is a high compliment. Yes. It's like, yeah, it's just not as gross. Not all John Waters is gross. Is it not? No. His most not recent book is pretty gross. Hmm. I think that's the two things that I'm pulling from. Gotcha. <laughs> Pink Flamingos and the most recent. The first that I knew of <laughs> ever and then <laughs> <laughs> the most recent thing I was exposed to. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's very fun. When Sophie is storming out of her trailer, she runs into Ben and says, what did she say? What do you want? Yeah. <laughs> what a weird thing to say. And he's like, uh, nothing. Like, not watch where you're going. No. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> if your point was to confuse the boy. <laughs> you, you did it. Good job. He is carrying empty Coke bottles and just, because he, he's just 
he's a what's known as a rousty, a roused about, just doing whatever needs to be done to keep the carnival going. Get it set up and keep it going. So after he's doing that, he's wandering from one place to another, and Ruthie pulls him over and she says, I need you to go <laughs> I need you to go fetch Gabriel's wrist cuffs. He's being a big baby and won't go on without them. Yeah, and this is scene two where Ben Hawkins a little bit of a mommy fetish. <laughs> He's like, oh my gosh, a woman is paying attention to me. Ooh, an older woman. So he runs off to her trailer to get Gabriel's cuffs, and he stops and touches a bunch of her stuff and smells her perfume. Oh yeah, mommy fetish getting worse. And then he finally comes back. He's like, I, sorry I took so long touching all your shit. I was giving in to my mommy fetish. <laughs> okay. You can like older people without it being this specific thing. No, that's what's going on with him. <laughs> You could do, yes, what you said is true, <laughs> but that's not what's happening. <sighs> so he, uh, so Gabriel gets his cuffs so he can go on, which is great. At Justin and Iris's, the, the Templeton, is both the Templetons or just, just Mr. Just Carol. Just Mr. Templeton. Just Mr. Carol Templeton. Templeton comes by and mainly he wants to talk to Justin about the, the migrant The migrant problem. <laughs> He says, is $50 enough to build the wall? <laughs> yeah. This is, this guy is exactly like someone you probably know today. He sits in the uh, the sitting room with Justin. Iris is dismissed to fetch them some cold lemonade. And <laughs> Templeton is used to getting his way. And he's just showing his ass the whole time. And Justin is used to dealing with people like this and gets ahead of it. And he's like, yes, yes, there's definitely a lot of people in our church. And I was thinking that you probably came here to talk about the migrants. They need their own church. And Templeton's like, um, yes. It I was just talking to Cora about that an hour ago. Is yep. that right? Ugh. Ugh. Yeah. And he, ugh. So Justin gets ahead of it. He's like, they need their own church so that our so that the churches can serve everybody in the community. Everybody is served and it's not overcrowded. Beautiful. So chins. Yes. And Templeton's like, yeah, no, that's not gonna happen. I'm not gonna sell you chins. And Justin says, Oh, no, you misunderstand me. You are going to give me chins. God has deemed it what he wants. And Templeton's like, God? What? Just because I go to church doesn't mean I believe in God. Exactly. And so Templeton offers $50 for, they can get a pretty nice tent for 50 bucks. <laughs> which they probably could. Which is, which is probably true. However, <laughs> not the point. And also not what God demands. No, well, I mean. So Templeton tells Justin no, and Justin gets pissed. He says, God damn it. Oh, that's right. He that's blasphemes right. in Justin's house. Right. That's when Justin gets pissed. That's right. He was expecting everything else. Yes. But when you say, God damn it, my house. So Ben Hawkins not allowed here. No. <laughs> Never. Clearly. Or me. <laughs> <laughs> ben and I are unwelcome. <laughs> and so he grabs Templeton again. And that's when the room goes black. Yes. And a spotlight hits him from the top. It's beautiful. It's beautifully done. And... Because they wanted to keep, this is 03, this is after Jurassic Park, this is, there are digital effects, but they wanted the show to feel analog, so they did everything analog. Good, it's so good. And specifically what they did was, they wanted to think about how this effect would happen in the 1930s. Ooh. How would they do it in the 1930s, and we're going to do it like that. That's awesome. Yeah, and that's why it looks so good. It's really incredible. So if you haven't seen this, it's definitely worth looking up this scene because it feels like, I love that you you said that and that they mentioned that in the commentary track because it feels like a stage play. The only time you can get this pitch black uh -huh. and this, this type of a feel is on a stage. And if you've been to a stage show, it doesn't matter if it's a show put on at the high school or something on Broadway. I don't care. If you've ever been to a stage show where they have that moment where they, everything's bright and then everything's dark all of a sudden, yeah. it's so intense. And that's what this feels like because it happens immediately. Immediately. And again, 
Justin is surprised by it. Yes, they both look around. Justin doesn't let Templeton go. No, he's got the, got the grip on him, but he's also surprised because he's never done this before either. Right. And they stand there and they have a little bit of a dialogue. And then the woman f- who we saw in episode one. Who works at Chen's. Yes. Comes out of the... The darkness. And that's when Justin goes with it. Yes. He's like, oh, something is happening here. I'm yes. going with it. He's like, and aha. He keeps that grip on Templeton. It's amazing. So she comes up and she rubs herself all over Templeton like a cat and purrs at him and says, oh, Mr. Templeton, you're back again so soon. And that's when she leads him into Chins. So it's, she like leads the... It's a it's a whole scene change with this whole oh it's beautiful and now they're outside of Chins and Justin is still gripping Templeton and he's like uh you can see him just being like I don't Templeton mm-hmm. I don't know if he knows exactly what's about to happen but he knows vaguely what's about to happen yeah he's like this is however much is about to be exposed none of it's good so then we go inside. And we see... Now we have two Templetons. Yes, we have two Templetons. We see a dancer who's almost naked. She's basically dancing in lingerie. We see drugs and gambling and exploitation of all kinds. Opium den. We see Templeton getting paid off with a an envelope full of money. Cash. Yeah. Just cash. And Templeton asks the guy who hands it to him, anything new on the menu? Which is gross even before you know what he's requesting. Uh-huh. Which is just a gross way to ask about a, a human being. Any human being. Uh-huh. Stop being so gross. I'm sorry. So he gets keys to room four. Justin still holding on to the other Templeton. Now the Templeton he's holding on to is trying to get away. He, he's he like, does not want to see this. No. And Justin says... What's the matter, Carol? Aren't you hungry? Look at you. You're, You're pre- famished. Yeah, it was. Ugh. Ugh, he's so scary. He is so scary. And so we follow the two of them. We follow the original Templeton in the dream world, whatever, in the vision memory. I don't know. Into the room. And as and then Justin pulls the other Templeton in front of the room. And Templeton looks like he's about to melt. Yeah. He's... Trying to leave his body. This actor does a fantastic job in this scene. It's amazing. And so then we see what they're seeing. And Templeton has walked into a room with a child. A little boy. A little Chinese boy. Who, production note. Yes. They mention how great him and his father were. They were fantastic. But the boy had a problem not laughing in the scene that's what he's doing when he looks uncomfortable he's squirming he's to not squirming laugh. to not laugh because when you first open the door and you see him i could tell he's trying not to laugh <laughs> so you said something when we were watching it about oh that poor boy no yeah. that boy's fine <laughs> okay <laughs> it, i'm so i'm glad i kind of led into that to let you relieve the situation because I didn't know the story and I'm just like, this has got to be so uncomfortable. (laughs) And it was, but not in a scarring way. Okay. In a, I can't stop laughing about it way. That's, that's good. (laughs) Okay. So what you need to do is sit here quietly and not laugh. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah. Okay. So as, (laughs) as Templeton the one that's being held by Justin is still trying to leave his body. And Justin has a grip on him. Iris walks po- walks by them from behind, hands them both lemonade. And now we are back at home. With lemonade. Yep. Yeah, isn't that nice? It's so good. Thank you, Iris. Yes. So good. And that is that whole scene. <laughs> After the carnival, we're back at the carnival, Jonesy shows us how he has had a lifelong crush on someone he's known since before she hit puberty, and that's a real problem. There's a word for that. (laughs) Yes, there is. If you've been actively pursuing it. I'm not going to give Jonesy any credit here, but I won't fully go hard at him if he didn't have this feeling the entire time. Yeah, it's hard to tell when this feeling started. But he definitely has it hard now. Definitely has it hard now, which is not okay. No. And Sophie is trying to let him down easy in a way that makes it apparent this happens, if not all the time, frequently enough. Yeah. And you can tell by both of them. Yeah. Because the actor, Tim 
Jonesy's actor. Yes. <laughs> Jonesy's actor does a real good job of hitting the different levels of understanding. Yeah. Everybody's so good at going through. They're right. It's the dialogue is there, but it's not the dialogue that gets all of this across. It's yeah. the body language. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. Stop it, Jonesy. <laughs> like literally anybody your age. <laughs> I don't care who. Um, what about the, he's not, he's not the lizard guy. What's his name? Gecko? Gecko. <laughs> so this is the only time that we see a peek into Gecko's tent or trailer. I'm not sure how it's set up right now, okay. but basically, again, a nice little tracking shot where it goes from one scene to the people who are witnessing it <laughs> yes. and talking about it. It's beautiful. So Gecko is saying, oh, poor Jonesy. And Dorame is, is in there with him and they're, they're hanging out. After the carnival. Jonesy apparently is not Gecko's type. Yes. She says something about you should go after him or something. And he's like, no, he's not my type. And he says the debutante is his type. Yeah. Don't know who the debutante is. No. It's not Sophie. Would it be? No, she's not a debutante. No, she's not. But that she's is she the right age to be a debutante? Probably. So maybe that's what they're talking about? No, she's probably too old. Yeah. This I'm, isn't a deb- debutante, like 15 or 16. Yeah. Uh. Which is really gross if you think about it. So don't think about it that much. We've got plenty of other gross things to think about. But yeah, Dorme and Gecko are just having a fun little gossip session. While peeling dead skin off of him. Eh, yeah, whatever. When you're friends, you're friends. <laughs> yeah, they are friends. I am not part of that situation. <laughs> Next, we see Lodes um, in his trailer with Samson. Lodes is talking about his concerns about Ben. And Samson says, Ben is just a harmless rube. Lodes is also pouring absinthe or preparing absinthe. And Samson is eyeballing it. (laughs) Again. Again. So we know that Lodes is having real absinthe, not the stuff that we have access to now. So it's always like, is he being dramatic? Is he seeing something? Is he seeing something because of the absinthe? (laughs) Seeing something or is he seeing something? Right. (laughs) And all of the above, any of the above is going to be extra dramatic because it's Lodes. Right. Lodes counters by saying that he saw Scudder in Ben's dreams. Samson doesn't care because Scudder's dead and he's been dead for years. On the contrary, he's alive and well. Yes. Lodes isn't convinced and asks Samson to bring the matter to management, since management used to listen to Lodes, but hasn't listened to Lodes since St. Louis. This is the second time we've heard about St. Louis, but we don't know why. Is it the second time? Okay. All right. So something went down in St. Louis. I think there was a mention of it in the first episode when Lila and Lodes were talking. Okay. About the thing in St. Louis, okay. kind of as a, in passing. So we know something happened. We just don't know what. He also loads, he being loads, also suggests that Samson take the carnival south instead of the usual northward course. But Samson disagrees and leaves the trailer. He says, thanks for the whiskey and sets it down. And he hasn't had any whiskey. And then loads takes the tiniest sip of absinthe. I don't know what absinthe Real absinthe tastes like, but it is the smallest sip. The stuff we get here is disgusting. I can he tell just you like that. he wet his whistle, <laughs> and then he just whistled a lot. Yep, because it was wet. Yep. <laughs> so outside the trailer, Samson is walking toward his trailer, and we see everybody kind of closing down for the evening. Jonesy dismisses everyone. He's like, as soon as all this stuff's tied down, go to bed. We watch uh, as Ben stumbles around to find a place to sleep. The quote, rousties, seem to bed down wherever they can. So we can tell that there's a difference between levels. And we've gotten a little bit of this in the dialogue, and you can just see a lot of it visually. Because you've got some of the performers have trailers, some of the performers share trailers, and some of the perform or not performers, and some of the other working folk just lay on wherever. You have a, you basically have a bedroll. If you're not a star, you're not a star. That's right. Which honestly wouldn't be bad because you're... As long as you're in a temperate location and it's not raining, seems fine. But inclement weather or south is going to suck. Lodes goes to Apollonia next, trying to convince her to let him in. So obviously something has happened between... They used to have some sort of relationship, whether romantic or friendly or whatever, but it is no longer that way. There is a good minute 
where it's just silence. Yes. And you can tell that they're having a conversation. It's so good. Ugh. It's so good. I love this fucking show. She is obviously angry about him, about whatever they're talking about and whatever he's suggest- suggesting. And when Sophie comes in, she's also pissed off and kicks him out. He leaves. Sophie, oh, he leaves. But before he does, he says, you've left me no choice. But then you know that. Yes. No choice but what? Right. Birds? We what don't are you know. Gonna do? Say the say the quiet part out loud. <laughs> yeah. We can't hear you. Tell don't show. That's <laughs> That's the rule, right? <laughs> Tell don't show. So when Sophie asks Apollonia if she's okay, Apollonia throws a porcelain cup at her. So Sophie storms out. We don't know where Sophie goes, but she's gone for a little while. Because next we see Ben bedding down under a truck. And then he falls asleep. I'm sure it doesn't take long because this has got to be hard work. Oh, yeah. So once you finally lay down, you're probably out pretty quick. We see his World War I nightmares, which, again, feature the Russian soldier who is stalking Scudder from No Man's Land. And the bear shows up. This is the first time we see the bear. We didn't see the bear in one of the other previews? No. This is the first time we see a bear. We oh. see the body, like something happening to the body around the corner, but we don't see the bear doing anything to it. This is the first time we see the bear. And Daniel Knopf, at this point in the commentary, said, I was arguing to get a real bear, but nobody else wanted to go for that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no, Dan. Leave the animals out of it. Because <laughs> it is kind of a ridiculous looking bear. It is. But that's fine. That's what you have to settle for so that you're not being cruel to animals. <laughs> Well, if they're doing it like they would in the 1930s, oh, they Jesus. would drug the hell out of a bear. <laughs> oh, my God. And then, like, electroshock it Remem- to make it do stuff. Remember all of the horror stories that came out of all of the real animals they used in the X-Files in the 90s? Yeah. Yeah. It hasn't gotten much better. I hate to tell you this, but the 90s was actually a long time ago now. I know, but do you think it's gotten much better, or do you think we just used I think it's all things? CGI, yeah. It hasn't gotten better. That's why it's not happening anymore. Because they can't use real animals, which is good. Oh. Although I'm still impressed that no cockroach <laughs> <laughs> during that shoot, except for the one of old age. I'll do a little cockroach autopsy to find that out. I don't know, but I think about it every time I see a cockroach. I'm How often do you see cockroaches? Not very often. More like every time I think I might have seen a cockroach. Okay. <laughs> Ben wakes up abruptly. <laughs> oh, the closed captions. It says, oh shit, pants. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> so <laughs> he kind of comes out of it and then he looks up and he sees Apollonia walking toward him. If we haven't mentioned it before, Apollonia, we have. Apollonia has not moved for an indeterminate amount of time. She can't. But now she is walking toward him. He stands up and is just kind of shocked because she's walking. And she reaches her hand out and he takes it. She gasps and whispers, you're the one. At the same time, Sophie returns to the trailer and finds her mother missing. She yells, mama! And at that moment, Apollonia collapses and Ben catches her before she hits the ground. Yeah, I'm always surprised by her voice. I don't know why. Every time I watch this episode, which is at this point... Five or six times. <laughs> right. I'm always shocked by her voice. This is not the voice I expect. And ben starts yelling, she's over here. And he's like, I don't know what to do. I just woke up from a nightmare. And then this woman who doesn't move is walking toward me. And now I'm the one. I don't know. <laughs> Sophie tears out of her trailer and is yelling, which makes sense. Ben is yelling also. So that gets the attention of everybody around. Sophie sees that Ben is holding Apollonia And in the panic, she's terrified of what this could possibly mean. And so some of the carnival guys come up and start punching Ben. Well, Gabe is the only one who punches him. Gabe is the only one who punches him? The other guys just grab him? They grab him and hold him, and then Gabe is punching him. Okay. I know Gabe does. And then Ruthie comes over and bodily removes Gabriel from Ben. Because Ruthie is the coolest person I've ever met. (laughs) Yeah, if we're talking about my actual favorite characters, as in, oh, I like this person, definitely Ruthie's the best one. Ah, Maybe Stumpy. I like Stumpy a lot, too. But 
Loads is my favorite character because oh. he's fucking loads. Oh my gosh. He's so dramatic. <laughs> he's who you aspire to be. He almost destroyed me. <laughs> <laughs> so Ben is getting ob- obliterated by the strongest man in the world. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> and Samson comes out. Sophie has gone to her mother, of course. And Sophie is terrified. She says, she can't, she's not, sp- I can't hear her. Why, why can't I hear her? Samson gets everybody off of Ben, and then he turns to Sophie and says, I don't know, honey. I really don't. Oh, and it's so just... It's gut-wrenching. It's so... Yeah, it's gut-wrenching. And so everybody kind of calms down. Ben has been released. Everyone's standing around. And then Samson says, what are you guys standing around for? Get her back inside. Right. And so it's it's perfect because it's exactly what you need. You need somebody who is calm... Which Samson never fails to be. Jonesy was trying to be calm. He was telling everybody to calm down and be quiet. But he was yelling <laughs> all of that. Jonesy's not good at this. He's trying, though. He is trying. Points for trying. But he also is yelling at Samson, We're just go- We just gotta clear this all up! And Samson <laughs> says, It's clear. <laughs> Which is what you really need. You don't need a Jonesy, you need a Samson. Yeah, I wasn't saying Jonesy was doing it right. No. I'm saying Jonesy's trying. He's so... F- okay, Jonesy is trying in a lot of areas, and he's just flailing a lot. <laughs> yep. It's like when you first try to swim, and you just kind of doggy paddle and splash a lot. Not me. You're not really swimming, but you sure are trying. I was a Johnny e. Lee Weissmuller from day one. Doubt it. I don't think I've ever seen you swim. Yes, you have. Where did we go to swim? The pool that's like 40 feet from here. No, we've, that's not really swimming. That's like being in the water and standing in it. Okay. The Gulf of Mexico, then? Did you swim there or did you just walk into it? I also swim there. Look, we've been to the beach like one time. Yeah. So we start, everybody starts clearing out because now there's nothing happening. Everything's kind of calming down. And finally, <laughs> Samson announces that the carnival will be moving south instead of north. Loads smirks. And Jonesy's like, south (laughs) it's hot down there and he said it's gonna be hotter than hades yes it will be yep so after um after ruthie forcibly made gabriel stop hitting ben which is the right move if you're somebody's mom you're allowed to like they're not gonna hit you it's fine (laughs) you can bodily move people your children, your adult children, whatever. She also kind of forcefully patches Ben up because yeah. she looks at him and she says, we got to get you cleaned up. And Ben just stands there and she's like, come on. <laughs> First he's resistant. And then she says, come on. And then he says, yes, mommy. <laughs> he goes inside and has Gabriel sit outside, which is actually, it makes sense because Gabriel's the one who just pummeled him. <laughs> you can't have them both in this. It's a very. Also, they won't all fit. It's a very condensed space. Gabriel it makes, is large. It makes sense for he him. He has to a just, large son. <laughs> he has a large son. Please sit outside calmly. I'll call you in a moment. But you also kind of get the feeling that Gabriel sat outside this trailer before. Yes. So he's just out there. Ruthie is applying ointment to Ben's ribs and or Ben's jaw and is checking his ribs. She wants to make sure that there's no hard feelings against Gabe. Gabe was just. Trying to protect, what does she say, Appy? Yes. Ben says there aren't any hard feelings. I think this is probably the first time he's been reasonable immediately, where he's just like, I, can't, I get it. Yeah. Also, <laughs> what's he going to do to Gabe? Right. <laughs> I understand I have no power in this situation, and I have decided to move forward. <laughs> it's, it's either that, or Ruthie said it, and he just went, yes, mommy. <laughs> either way, he's complying. <laughs> It's fine. As he's getting up to, he puts on his shirt and he thinks about it. And he, as he gets up without his shirt, Ruthie gives him a good up and down. (laughs) She has this appreciative smile on her face. She, I fucks the hell out of this (laughs) scrawny little boy. She's probably seen the same dudes so often. He's a new guy. (laughs) I mean, I'm not mad at her for it. She's like, look. At least she did it to his back. Right. She's like, I didn't say anything. I didn't touch him. I didn't suggest anything. I just appreciated the view. Yeah. Why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the best view. <laughs> it's but a, it's a different but one. Yes, but it's a new view. 
I love the smirk on her face where she's just like, I know what I'm doing. (laughs) But he turns around and she fixes her face and he shows her the picture that he found. She knows who Flora was, but she didn't know her personally. Ruthie explains that the woman is Scudder's old sweetie, that Scudder traveled with the carnival and performed as the gentleman geek. So she shows him a picture of him. She shows Ben a picture of Scudder as the gentleman geek. Uh, wearing his trademark black tuxedo. They have a little bit of a discussion, and she confirms that Scudder might have been in the war. There were a lot of crazy-ass men <laughs> that were in the war. What a wild thing to say. And I was like... Basically, she just said Scudder was crazy as fuck. Yep. And he was also a drunk. Ben reveals to Ruthie that the woman in the picture is his mother, Flora Hawkins. So Ruthie is like, that lady we buried back in wherever we were? And he's like, yeah. She's like, huh. A lot of things start her. A lot of things are making sense now that I'm thinking about when that was and how old you are. And hmm. and she starts looking at him real different. Yes, <laughs> yes. Her wheels are turning. Yes, they are. She's like, huh? Does he ask if he can keep the picture, or does she just say he can keep the picture? I can't remember. Uh, he, he asks. Okay. And she just yeah. Which makes sense. And so then he leaves, and she's like, "Well, I've got some shit to think about now." <laughs> so. I want to talk about geeks for a second. Okay. We watched Nightmare Alley with your favorite actor, Bradley Cooper. Fucking hell, don't tell people I like him. (laughs) Then people are going to famously know me for not being rich and for liking that guy. That guy, okay. But in that, they tell a story of how geeks are sort of created by uh, alcoholics given opiates Mm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Apparently, completely wrong. You mean a Bradley Cooper joint was False? A Guillermo del Toro joint is false. That which, movie was disappointing for yeah. coming from that man. Agreed. But apparently they would just grab the local drunk wherever they were at and give them some booze and money. Oh. To bite the heads off of things. Chickens are what it's famously, but it's just stuff. Biting the heads off of animals. So Daniel Knopf was just like, so I just always liked the idea of a gentleman geek. So <laughs> another thing that's just completely made up. I like that. It seems less gross. Oh, like the baggage trailer. Baggage trailer is not a real thing that carnival people do. That's something that he made up. That makes sense. Yeah. Why would it be? It wouldn't make sense to have extra stuff. No, the baggage trailer being a joke you play on people. Oh, yeah. I'm sure each carnival had their own joke they played on noobs. Yeah. But also the line, something about mud bugs on a griddle. Yeah. When Ruthie said that. The commentary track, they started razzing Daniel Knopf for that line. Why? (laughs) Because they were like, what was that line? Was that a real thing people said? And he was like, no, it's just something I wrote. They're like, it's not good. Is Daniel Knopf from the South? I have no idea. Because that's what we call him. Yeah, but have you ever heard the phrase mud bugs on a griddle? Maybe. Those are two words that people say a lot in the South. Well, they made fun of him. Well. I'm sorry. I wasn't there. I like the idea. When she said it, I was like, Ruthie, are you from Louisiana? <laughs> that's that's really what I thought. In Minturn, Justin gets chins. Shocking. Yes. Templeton is like every other wealthy and influential person, a fucking coward. He ends his life, leaving behind a family during the Great Depression to fend for themselves. Super cool. Oh, a rich family, though. I don't know how it works back then. I think in the 30s, it wasn't nearly like it was before i think she's allowed to own the stuff now i wonder shrug they can, i mean she, she can sucks. vote she sucks too if but she can vote she could probably own property maybe it's unclear now you said what did you say i said he's a fucking coward no when, <laughs> specifically you said something about how when you're caught for something and i don't even think it's that deep i think it's just him being shown what he did Oh, you think he's having some sort of remorse? It's seeing your actions from the outside. I don't even think it's the threat of being outed. No, I don't think there's a threat there. No. So it's just, I think it's just, it has to be internal because there is no external threat. Yeah. It's just being shown who you are from the outside. Oh my God. Is this the first time he's had any insight into himself in his entire fucking life? I'm sure. This is. Apparently, this town also needs a therapist. Yeah. <laughs> the Minturn therapist. Every Everyone go to therapy. I know that's not easy for everybody. 
But this guy's rich, so he should go to therapy. Even 1930s therapy, they would just be like, I don't know, you probably, it's penises and- You want to bang your mom. Yeah, that's it. Who are you, Ben Hawkins? (laughs) Ew. There is incest in this, though. Or at least implied incest. There's not even implied incest. There's just hints of weird desires. Incestual desires. Yeah, but not the act of it. Justin returns home high on power and looks longingly at his sleeping sister. And then he turns off the radio, which wakes her up. And then as soon as she wakes up, as soon as he's like, oh, are you here to serve me? He slumps down in his chair. He tells her everything about chins, about how it's a calling from God that he opens this ministry for the migrants. And at first she's taking it all in. I love her performance right here. It's phenomenal. She is unreadable and it is scary. Yes. It's chilling. I love it. And then it's like she realizes it or she knows it's her cue to respond. And so she changes and Uh she's like, this is wonderful. Uh And Justin breaks down. Yeah. Oh, my God. And she gets up to comfort him in a way that's sibling-like, but somehow suggestive of more. Something about the way that they shot this scene was like, this would be fine if probably we didn't see that earlier scene. (laughs) Right. Now it just feels weird. Yeah. They say something in the earlier scene, because we didn't talk about it at all. But in the commentary, they say something in the about the earlier scene that is just, there are no healthy relationships in this show. Correct. (laughs) None. Correct. That is more insight than Templeton ever had. (laughs) Later, we see Justin return to his room to self-flagellate. That's not a euphemism. Actually, it probably is a euphemism, (laughs) but it's it's what we really see happening. (laughs) And as you might be wondering, but wait, wouldn't his sister hear this happening? Because he's hitting himself with a leather whip, which is really kinky. Um... (laughs) And we pan through the living room where Iris is awake now and she's sewing. I think she's cross-stitching, listening to the radio, and she stops because she hears something. She listens for a moment, and then she continues on with her activities. So she knows what's happening. Yes. In the final scene, the carnival is wrapping up. Ben sees the little hat and vest from the bear and his nightmares attached to the side of management's trailer. What does that mean? And then... Credits. Credits. Wow. Yep. All right, Kristen, there's a lot to happen in that episode. Everybody that was in this episode, they're all tired. They're, they went through a lot. They did. Do you have anything, maybe an emotional music song? <laughs> emotional music song. That perhaps... Emotional music song. <laughs> that they could listen to and just get into their feelings a little bit. Yes, I do, actually. I have a song. It's called... A Couple Curled Up Pictures. A Couple Curled Up Pictures. All right. It's from 1994 by Evergreen. Evergreen. Yes. And here's a little bit about this song by Nina Corcoran. On their debut album, Seven Songs, the trio introduced this expansive, faux sloppy approach with opener A Couple Curled Up Pictures. What begins with a couple of distant meandering guitar lines gets shoved out of the way for dizzying riffs and a sped up chorus. The lyrics provide the context. A protagonist, staring at old photographs, can't shake a difficult question from his mind. And the music provides the details, turning an otherwise barren personal track into a melodramatic, relatable recounting. Can you see why I may have picked this one? Just like looking at a picture of your mom from before (laughs) you were born. A couple curled up pictures introduced Evergreen as a band that could turn post-hardcore into an intimate affair. And since ending in 1997, it continues to be a low-flying influence, in part by drummer Jason Bozell, may have mispronounced that name, going on to play for Rilo Kylie, another band I like, and Bright Eyes, another band I like, <laughs> in the following decade. Well, lovely. Yeah. All right. So now they have a couple curled up pictures to listen to. Good for them. The Rotating Cast Files is produced by Kristen Riley and Dave Reed, edited by Dave Reed. Thanks for being here, and if you enjoyed the episode, please rate, review, and subscribe. Please go to Apple Podcasts and give us five stars. Tell us that we are fighting the righteous battle in podcasting good and evil. 
That old time religion. That old time podcast religion. Or even easier, tell people about us. It really helps us out. You can check us out on Twitter and Instagram at Cast Files. We also auto post to YouTube if that's your streaming service of choice, or if you like closed captions. And finally, email us at therotatingcastfiles at gmail.com.